I'll be ready to go. You know, that's the problem with life in general. It doesn't have background music. Do you know that? I mean, in the movies, there's background music, so you know when something's going to happen. Okay, but regular life doesn't have the background music. You don't see it coming. It's kind of disappointing on that. So, okay, thank you all. Let me go ahead and, uh, and pray, and we will uh, get started here today. Lord, we thank you for our time that we can come together. We can focus on you. We can talk about this great gift that you have given us, this free gift of eternal life. And Lord, you want us to, to grow from there. That is just the start, the start of not only uh, our eternal life here in this physical world, but for, e for eternity as well. So Lord, as we talk about that today, help us to be encouraged and excited uh, to follow you more. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Okay, the title is something like this. We, I struggled with this a little bit. Um, Bob and I went back and forth on this. Calling people to discipleship without confusing them. In other words, lordship sanctification, not lordship salvation. And, and that's descriptively <clears throat> what I'm talking about. That really is <clears throat> case. It just doesn't, it isn't a catchy title. It doesn't have zombies in it or anything. So... Uh, uh, but what I'm going to do is, so that's our subject, and that's correct. That's right. Um, but I'm going to shift it to how I talk about things at our church. And, what I'm, and you'll see where I'm going with this in just a moment. So I'm going to talk about, at our church, I'm going to talk about <clears throat> challenging people to live an elevated life by living it for Jesus. An elevated life by living it for Jesus. Now, I'm aware that there are various churches that use the word elevate, elevate church and so forth. It seems to be pretty uh, common some places. But in Utah, what we have is right at the, uh, right at the bottom, it's, it is a motto for our state, life elevated. That's what's on our our license plates, life elevated. So we're connecting with that concept in terms of talk about, talking about an elevated life. But the general publicity stuff from Utah is, is life elevated with Utah. So we're, but we're talking about living an elevated life with Jesus. It's elevated in terms of not only how we're living it, but having an eternal and higher perspective in that sense, very much, very much elevated. So that's where the terminology live an elevated uh, life by living it for Jesus comes from. Now, the part I'm going to address here <clears throat> is the question of why. The question of why. Why should I? Okay? Let's say somebody's got it straight. I believe in him for eternal life. 1 Timothy 1.16. I think that's the, the briefest, most concise statement about what's required. I know we have John 3.16, but Paul is writing to Timothy, and he refers to um, what's happening so that in the future people might believe in him for eternal life. That's as succinctly as you can say it, I think. So let's say somebody's got that straight, and yes, switching from one computer to another has redistributed things. Eternal life is a free gift, and I believe in Jesus. So the person says, I've got it. I've got it. It's not, it doesn't have anything to do with my works. I have assurance of salvation. And then you say, well, okay, so now let's talk about spiritual growth. And it's like, why? I have my insurance policy. My eternity is certain. I have assurance of salvation. And now you want me to do more stuff? Why should I do that? What's that about? Now, I'm going to ask you the question, I want you to talk to me, I'll re-say your statements to get them on the recording. I do not <clears throat> want a paragraph or a sermon. Give me phrases or a short sentence. This is always a risky deal I, uh, in terms of doing this, and I've had challenges doing this before, but I still think it's very valuable. Just you personally shout out here, and then I'll want to say it back for the sake of the recording, why you say, okay, I have eternal life and I know it. Why do you care about growing spiritually or living for eternity or serving the Lord? Why do you care about that? And there's many, many right answers. So, go. I want to hear him say, well done. You want to hear him say, well done. Absolutely. What else? I want to enjoy him more. 
want to enjoy him more. Now, that can be both now and even in eternity. Yes? Freedom and maturity. Freedom and maturity. Excellent. One way to show my gratitude. One way to show gratitude. Excellent. Because. <laughs> because. There's always a philosopher in the group. Yes, indeed. Get to know him better. Get to know him better. Absolutely. Absolutely. We're called to. We're called to. Excellent. We're commanded to. Excellent. Yes. Yeah, God's way gives us a better life. It's just smart to follow him from a selfish perspective. He gave me the choice. I can actually decide if I'm going to or not. Anyway, you guys have done excellent. You just covered my talk. Do you know that? <laughs> there it is. There it is. Um, I covered the talk. What I'm, what I'm trying to focus on is how I talk to people when I'm faced with that question. And sometimes very sincere people will say this various ways. They'll say, you know, I'm not worried about rewards and stuff. I, I just think when I get to be with Jesus, it's just going to be so good that I, I don't know why I should focus on that. Uh, that just doesn't seem to make sense to me. And uh, so I want to try to give you an example that I, I hope you will improve upon on how I talk about this as I interact with people. I want you to notice, I'm gonna give you a list, it's only gonna have six, which by the way, I think you covered every one of the six, so that's excellent. There's gotta be at least 25 of them, you know, in terms of good reasons. But I wanna remind you, as we take a look at um, physical life, now, I believe that starts at conception, but a zygote isn't that cute, so I've, I went with the baby. Um, and then, then we die at this point. Hopefully a person comes to believe in Jesus Christ uh, at, at some point in this process. And at that point, very critical thing, they receive eternal life. Their eternal life begins. And that's called justification salvation. Uh, I'm, I'm guessing JV just went through this uh, it, by the title. Uh, and then this time frame right here is uh, dealing with sanctification salvation. And it is not as a straight line like that in most cases. Um, somebody's salvation says, well, I think it goes like this. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, that's probably about right. That's, that's probably about right. And uh, let's see. And so then we, have, uh, then we have glorification, salvation, thinking of the three aspects of God's deliverance. Deliverance from the penalty of sin, deliverance from the practice of sin, and deliverance from the presence of sin. Those three things. So our discussion has to do with this whole area of life here. From when I get eternal life to when I go to glorification salvation. What about that, that time frame right here, which is my life? That really is a mess. Let me do this. Uh, this time frame right here, I'm living life as a believer until I die. What about that right there? So that's what we're taking a look at. Why should I care? Um, I'm just talking about this in a general sense. Why should I care? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you three reasons God says I should. It helps my life. Somebody commented on that. It matters for eternity. It matters for eternity. Those are just three broad reasons why I should care at all. Okay. Um, I'm going to talk about six specific ones, but you really can... Uh, I mean, you can appeal to somebody and talk about the, the ROI on the situation. What's my return on investment in terms of what I'm doing? Well, there's a lot of return on investment. And so sometimes you actually have to talk in financial terms to people and say, in terms of saying, yeah, your effort in will result in this. A diagram I use often, and I'm just reminding you of this, I expect you have seen it a number of times, is that uh, here you have justification, salvation, and that's, that's the start of eternal life. That's what that green, green line is. Here's physical death. Eternal life just continues all the way through. And that is a unconditional inheritance. It does not depend on how we live or act. Unconditional. Results in eternal life. Now, as we take a look, that depends on what we believe. What we believe. But then we add to that sanctification, salvation, and that is a conditional inheritance. That is conditional. It does depend on how we live, and that results in, in eternal rewards. This you know. 
Uh, that depends on how we, how we live. It very much does. This is the part you, I just find I have to remind people of regularly, this part right here. You, you all know this. You keep it straight. But when I'm talking to people, confusion reigns. And I just have to go over this and over this um, to say, no, you got to keep these two things straight. And that's critically important. And then that's glorification, salvation, after the person dies to pick up the third one. I just removed it for clarity. If you keep those two things separate, then it all, the, the verses and everything fits together very nicely. Then you don't end up with lordship salvation, but you can now talk about lordship sanctification. It's interesting how that has crammed that together. My original slide didn't do that. Um, it's what? It looks good. Okay. <laughs> yeah, okay. If you mix these things two together, these two things together, there we go, get the order of my words correct, um, then you don't end up with this, this situation that's, that's happening today fairly often, in, in my opinion, where somebody says, you have initial, initial salvation, and that is by faith. But then... What happens is, as you live life, down here, you have final salvation, final salvation, and that is by works. So this is how they put it together, okay? So be on guard for this terminology about initial salvation and final salvation. It is sneaking in a lot of places. And what you end up with, then, is you end up with Salvation starts when you die. This is at, at, at the end of your life. It starts when you die, and it's based on faith and works. That's how they put the two together. So they're happy to talk about initial salvation being by faith alone, Christ alone. Yes, they agree. But the rest of the story is you better perform until you get to the end because at the final salvation, at your death, whether you get eternal life or not is determined by your actions. And so here's the challenge as I, as I try to encourage people to live for Jesus is not to have them fall into this kind of a mess and get the things all confused, okay? That's what I'm wrestling with. Now, let me step through uh, reasons I typically use to talk to people. If I'm trying to communicate to them, encourage them to say, yeah, you really do need to grow spiritually. Let me... Let me give you some reasons why. And what I want you to do is I want you to think about which of these six uh, resonate with you. Now, you already identified ones that were particularly valuable to you, and you'll see all of them show up on my list that we commented on. But that's what I... They're actually... People respond different ways. The uh, uh, assurance of salvation, I really think, is the foundation and understanding belief versus living your life. And so when we deal with our efforts to please Jesus, I'm having to say this all the time, we serve Jesus not to get salvation. We serve Jesus not to pay Jesus back or to prove I'm saved or to keep my salvation. Those are words I'm having to say over and over. We, we serve Jesus because we have salvation, because we have it. That's why. And once again, what I'm running into in my experience as I interact with people, I just have to say this over and over and over again. Just keep reminding them of their, of their focus. So let me step through six things. I'm going to go through the slide very fast, and then we're going to take them one at a time. Uh, love for Jesus. I belong to Christ. Have a useful and fruitful life. Invest in eternity. Commanded to mature and reign with Christ. Now I'm going to step through them. Love for Jesus. Very straightforward, John 14, 15. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. Notice it doesn't say, if you want eternal life, keep my commandments. It doesn't say, keep my commandments, and if you do a good job, you'll have eternal life. No, it talks about, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. Now, the part that's critical on this is the relational aspect. I truly think that we need to impose a relationship focus on our relationship with Jesus. I think we just have to keep talking about it that way. And the reason for that, somebody one time said, well, give me a verse that says 
Jesus is talking, that says it's a relationship. Well, it's the word no. No is the relationship term. Shows up all over the place. No. You know somebody to various degrees. That's the relationship term. So, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. I also tend to think that the commandments uh, are what reveal what God cares about. So, for example, you do, the, you do a search in the New Testament letters, Romans through Jude, you search for Greek imperatives, Greek commands, you'll come up with over 500 of them. The vast majority of those are commands to believers on what to do. Now what you can do, and I appreciate Bob Wilkin making this distinction, you can focus on the commands, or you can focus on the commander. You can focus on the law part, the rules, and you just replaced 613 Old Testament law with new ones, or you can focus on the, on the one who has given the commands. I view those as ex expressing the will of God, expressing the will of God. That's what God says is important. Now, here's my wonderful and beautiful wife, um, and I love her, so she fortunately does not give me commands, or one should say at least rarely, um, but I care greatly about what is important to her. I pay attention, and so if there's something that's important to her, then I want to do that to please her because I love her. It's not burdensome. I, I don't feel resentful because I have to do this. Uh, in one sense, I don't have to do this, but uh, you know, uh, she likes Starbucks coffee, grande, non-fat non, non milk, okay? I buy many of those. I don't even drink coffee, but I go to Starbucks often, and I know exactly what to get for my wife. And I do this because I love her. And I think love is the primary big main one. If we love Jesus, then we care about what he says. So when you look at his commands, you should look at them and say, you know, this is what Jesus thinks is important. These are the things that matter to him. And if I love him, then what matters to him matters to me. And so think of commands as not a burden, but as, a, as communication telling us what's important to Jesus, what he thinks, what he values. And, and I find that uh, very helpful in terms of thinking about serving Jesus. As, as I, that's his, uh, what he communicates is valuable to him. Love for Jesus. Okay, that's the first one. Another one is I belong to Christ. I belong to Christ. I'm not, uh, you know, we, we're in America. I can do whatever I want to. I'm in control of my life. I make my decisions. That's the way it is. Nobody's going to tell me. Now, by the way, if you take a story approach to, to presenting the gospel, it, it goes like this. You have the creation when everything was in harmony with people with each other, Adam and Eve, and with God, and with nature, and with everything, uh, but they believed a lie. And, came, and then what happens is the rebellion. And the rebellion was not that they committed some great crime, it's that they said, you know what, I can live life apart from God, independent of God. Nobody's going to tell me what to do. That's the rebellion. Now, by the way, I talk to people and I say, you know what, we're still living the rebellion and if I'm honest with myself and if you're honest with yourself, you probably see hints of the rebellion. Hints of the rebellion that says, nobody's telling me what to do. That's the rebellion. So Jesus, so God had to send a rescuer, had to send a hero to rescue us from our rebellion so we could have a relationship with him. And then we could be part of the recreation or the restoration. So you've got creation, rebellion, rescue, and uh, restoration. And so it matters, do, it, do I belong to myself? Well, Jesus says, Paul says to the Corinthians, he reminds them, for you have been bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body. I am not my own. I'm not my own. I need to shift my thinking. It isn't this American independence thing. I belong to Christ. It's another reason why I need to live for him. The third one I, is, a, is the one that I often get the most mileage out of is have a useful and fruitful life versus a wasted one. I really think we need to reclaim James 2. We've, 
you know, we're always having the battle over does it prove your salvation and so forth. Once we have this clear, which we do, let's start talking about it much more in terms of James 2 talks about living a life that is useful, profitable, or good, depending on which translation you use. And he uses the illustration of a believer that needs something because if we live our faith, we can help other believers. He goes to Abraham. If we live our faith, it'll mature our faith, perfect it. We need to mature it. if we're And, and with uh, Rahab, uh, in her case, it even can deliver us physically or even our family. And I think we have to emphasize that. Notice the terminology James 2.16, you say to somebody that has needs, go in peace, be warmed and filled, and yet you do not give them what's necessary for their body. What use is that? But are you willing to recognize, you foolish fellow, that faith without works is useless? Um, and then you'll see these terms show up, unfruitful, or Second Peter, useless or unfruitful. And see, there's a danger. He, he doesn't say unless we discover that you really weren't saved. No, the believers could be useless or, or uh, fruitful or use, yeah, useless or unfruitful or useful and, and fruitful. And if you watch, you're going to find this terminology showing up that you will not be unfruitful. What kind of life are we going to live? Is our life going to impact eternity or not? Another aspect of this that we're exploring at this point and I've been doing now for a couple years is helping people understand their divine design that God has designed them for a purpose that God has designed them for a purpose I don't happen to hold to an individual perfect will idea okay I'm coming in with Gary Friesen uh, on that um, I don't think there's a will to discover a dot that we have to locate but I think we just, we're just not a random creation. Psalm 139 explains that we're very specifically designed, and I think we do have purpose. Um, and Ephesians 2.10, I don't have this up, Ephesians 2.10, talking about created for good works, that's talking about the body of Christ, Jews and, and Gentiles together. It's not, people want to make it individual. Um, but there's an organization, they happen to make it individual, I don't agree with them, called Unique, Designing the life that God dreamed for you. And I do have a, is there anybody back in the sound? I do have a video clip here. Uh, I don't know if the sound is up or not. Let's see. The sound is not up. Okay. Maybe I'll come back to that. There's, there's something we've been doing. There's two versions of this. There's a six-month version and a six-week version. And this is the six weak version that introduces it where you help figure out how God has designed you so that you can get to the place where you talk about uh, how God has made you. There's a high school version, high school college version of this as well, um, and there's a much more intent, uh, intentional cohort that I take people through that takes about six months. Uh, Don, I'll have you get me some sound if you can find it there. What time am I going to? Uh, questions at 11. Yeah, okay, questions at 11, that's good. I'm good. Okay, I've got it playing, so there should be some audio source on this. Okay, I'm going to carry on. Uh, this is one that uh, I am able to... Okay, we'll see about getting some sound here. Okay, there's some sound source coming from my... <laughs> okay. Okay, that's fine. Okay, can I go back in? Okay, let me go back in. Okay, let's see if we got it. There it is. Thank you. What if everything you need to be who God 
God's called you to be, you already have. It's just this huge form. What if you could tap into this unique way of understanding what it means to be a disciple of Jesus, that you're not just doing the things you have to do, but you're getting to do the things that you want to do in such a way that it honors God? See, I think I spent a whole lot of my life praying for trees, and God gives me a seed, and I'm convinced he hasn't answered my prayer. When the truth is, in that seed is the potential of an entire forest. Take an arrow. We want to take that image and think about our lives. How can we be intentional, design it in such a way that we're going to, at the end of our lives, celebrate hitting the mark? You can't create the forest without risking the seed. I wonder how many of us are holding on so tightly to the good that we know that we can't receive from God the greater good that we don't know. There's that one thing that God has put us on the earth to accomplish, and when we can tap into that, here is where we will find the greatest sense of joy and peace. God's been having a dream about your life from the beginning of time. He's been dreaming about who you would be and what you would do. So what if that God dream is both knowable and nameable? We at Unique believe it is. And we believe the world is waiting for you to step into the unique dream that God has created you to live out. I think this is an area, you don't have to use unique, we happen to use unique, but I think we need to talk with our people about how their careers and how the other aspects of their life fit into the big picture and matter for eternity. Their work matters, their life matters. And sometimes, here's the, class, here's, the, here's the extreme that's bad. <laughs> the extreme that's bad is the concept that what people do in terms of serving Jesus, the only thing that counts is what is inside our building, what is on Sunday. There is the classic mistake. The only thing that counts is what's inside our building on Sunday morning. And if you're not part of that, you're not part of what's important. No, we... God's at work for the whole week. We have to lift up the value of, of careers and positions and jobs and opportunities that people have um, so that they understand the eternal value and significance of this. But people don't tend to think of themselves as divinely designed for purpose. And you need to know purpose trumps passion, by the way. Purpose trumps passion. People have passion for different things, but purpose trumps passion. Give people purpose, eternal, life-elevated purpose, and that will motivate a whole lot more than a passion, which is emotional, okay? Um, have a useful and fruitful life. I challenge people, say, are you going to live, you know, what kind of life are you going to live? Is it going to be significant or not? Invest in eternity. Um, you know the passage, do not command, do not store up for yourself treasures on earth where moths and rust destroy. And I say to them, I have them read the passage. I say, no, what are we not supposed to do? Not supposed to store up. I say, oh, by the way, that's a command. Store up what? Treasures. Okay, now for who? For yourself. Well, that's pretty selfish. What does it say? For yourself. Who said it? Jesus. Okay. That's... <laughs> That's how I hit the reward stuff. I don't start with rewards because I get stuck in this conversation. Well, that's pretty selfish and so forth. I'm like, no, let's just go to Matthew. Let's see what Jesus said. Here's what Jesus said. Read the passage. Did Jesus get it right? You know, they're happy to disagree with me, but they're real reluctant to disagree with Jesus. You notice that? Okay, what are we supposed to do instead? Store up what? Treasures. Okay, for who? Yourself. This is investing, folks. Investing. Now, for where, where your treasure is, your heart will be also. I, I think we tend to get this backwards. We look to see what we value, and then we say our heart is there. That's half right. I think what happens is this, command, this is commanding us to treasure things that are eternal. And if we intentionally decide to treasure things that are internal, what's going to happen with our heart? It's going to follow. So I don't think it's diagnostic. I don't think it's diagnostic. I think we choose treasure and our heart follows. That sort of idea. When I was an engineer and I remember walking into my to a cubicle and giving my supervisor a resignation letter 
One of the things that was in my resignation letter is I said, only one life will soon be passed, only what's done for Christ will last, not original with me. Turns out there's various people credited with this statement, so I don't know the answer. But you don't have to quit engineering and go into ministry to do that. What you do as an engineer can be of eternal value, but we've got to champion that. And sometimes as pastors, we don't do that. We champion kind of the spiritual side. We don't champion the person that is serving in a secular job. And they're making a significant difference for eternity, but they don't think that way. They don't think that way. We have to encourage them so that they understand. <clears throat> Life is like a $100 bill. As you explain to kids, you only get to spend it once. How are you going to spend it? You can spend it in pieces, get change, but you only spend it once, only once. How are you going to spend your $100 bill? That's your life. Limited time, 70, 80 years. You have to spend it one time. How are you going to spend it? Same principle. Let me suggest to you, you don't just spend it. You invest it. You invest it in eternity so it multiplies. That's what you do. Now, you can... You can grow up and graduate from college. You don't have to graduate from college. Graduate from college, get a functional job, go buy a functional house. I'll take it from a male perspective. Get a functional wife, have some semi-functional kids, uh, get a functional cat and a dysfunctional dog, and you can spend your life functioning, functioning, functioning. You can just function. Do you want to just function? I haven't had anybody say, yeah, yeah, that's what I want to do. I just want to function. No. I said, okay, well, then let's talk. I don't want you to just function either. Let's do something significant. Let's do something that matters. Let's do something that makes a difference, not only in this life, but for eternity. We can do that because God is at work. We can do that. Isn't that cool? Or you can spend your life and just function. Some people do. Invest in eternity. We're commanded to mature. I think that's the point in Hebrews as he writes to believers. He says, let us press on to maturity. And that's how you say a first-person plural command uh, is, is with this let us. And that's what he does in Hebrews 6.1. And that's, he's going to do it. He invites them to do it. At the end of 2 Peter, the last two verses in chapter 3, he tells us that we have to be on guard. Knowing beforehand, be on guard so that you are not carried away by error of unprincipled men and fall from our own steadfastness. I think that alludes to put on the armor of God. But then it says, but grow. And I mentioned this verse yesterday. But grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be glory for now and to the end of eternity. That's a command. That expresses what God thinks, what Jesus thinks is important. He thinks it's important we grow. He does. Now, isn't that what we want for our kids? It's important to us that they grow. Well, he wants his kids to grow too. So he made it a command just so that we're clear. He wants us to grow. We're commanded to mature and grow. Reign with Jesus. Reign with Jesus. Um, you'll know the passage. Second... Uh, Timothy, I have all these passages marked in my Bible here except that one. <clears throat> it is a trustworthy statement, <clears throat> for if we died with him, we'll also live with him. Those that believe in Jesus have died with Jesus, so they, we're, we're going to live with him. And then here's the two conditional options. If we endure with him, we will also reign with him. But enduring is required. Enduring is required. Then he goes on, if we deny him, because what's the other extreme? And he, by the way, he's still talking about reigning. If we deny him, he will also deny us. Deny us what? The opportunity to reign. Well, do you want to reign in eternity? Now, by the way, I have a lot of people that will say to me, no, I really don't. I don't I'm not interested in reigning, okay? Um, I, I find this more with women. They're like, no, I, I'm, I, don't, I don't have a need to be in charge and stuff. I'll have more guys going, yeah, reigning sounds good. Let me go with that. So it's not for everybody. See how that works? But it's, it's a motivation. Reign with Jesus. Okay, here's, so here's the six. 
here's the six I tend to talk about. I tend to talk about. Now, kind of the glaring omission is, is rewards, but I already told you why. I hit it with treasure. I hit it with uh, invest in eternity. So, um, so that's what I'm, what I'm doing. Uh, I just want to have you raise your hands. If I limited your choices to these six, which one would be the most, is at just at this time in your life, in your opinion, which one is the most motivational to you right now, right now for you? Okay, I, for love for Jesus. You can only choose one, only choose one. I, you all love Jesus, I understand. So if you don't vote for that one, it's okay. Okay, okay, I belong to Christ. That's motivational to you. Uh, have a useful and fruitful life. <clears throat> okay, invest in eternity. Okay, uh, commanded to mature. Okay, uh, reign with Jesus. Okay, now, this, I'm not using this against you. Did, you. did you observe, though, which one had the most? All of them are good. All of them are good. It's not a problem. Which one had the most? Three, have a useful and fruitful life. That's what I've found in my experience as well, is I appeal to people to say, what kind of life do you want to have? They, do want to, they don't want to waste their life. They don't want to waste their life. All these others are excellent, excellent, but they don't want to waste their life. And so that's where I typically find, but sometimes it's these others that people really respond to. And, and besides, there's another 20, you know, there's all kinds of them. But when I'm talking uh, to people, that's kind of what's, what's been the situation. Anybody notice anything else besides specifically mentioning rewards that's missing from the list? Avoid discipline, yeah, and that's a very valid one. You know, most of us are punishment adverse. So I, I just want you to know that that's not all there. there. There's more to it than that. The way I think about it is, uh, I, and this is not original with me at all, I think Bob has said it, maybe other people have said it, but I want my life to be a thank you card. I'm not trying to earn my salvation, but I sure can write a thank you card. How do I write it? I write it by showing that I love Jesus by doing the things he cares about. That's how I write my thank you card life. My thank you card life. That's how I, how I write it. <clears throat> my wife and I, uh, this is uh, Maybird, Maybird Gulch. This is a hike we did probably at the beginning of July in Utah. We have all kinds of <clears throat> places to hike in Utah. And this was just a very gorgeous <clears throat> place, excuse me. There's a series of about four little ponds there in Maybird Gulch. This is a seven mile round trip hike, about 2,200 feet vertical. Uh, takes us, it's five hours of hiking. That's really the max that my wife and I will do. After that, it becomes work. And I have nothing to prove. So, you know, there's, I talk to other guys here. They're like, oh, let's go do this because it's this big challenge. I'm going, I'm long past that. I just go, I go hiking in the mountains with my wife because she's beautiful and the mountains are beautiful. That's what I do. Now, if it get, becomes a lot of work, then I'm out of here. I'm not doing that. So this is what we do, and it's great. We have a great time. Very few people were up there, and very few people see it because you have to take the time, the effort, and the work to do it, Okay. Unfortunately, I think that illustrates what happens with lots of believers who have eternal life. They do not see the beautiful, great high points of an elevated life because they do not put in the work and effort and time and energy required to see the cool places, not only in our world, but to live a life that fully experiences the great things that Jesus has for us because it requires effort it requires time, it requires energy, requires discipline, requires work. And so it doesn't happen. I view my task as inviting believers to go on an adventure. I'm like, let's go on an adventure. Is it going to take time? Yes. Is it going to be work? Yes. Is it going to take energy? Absolutely. But let's go on an adventure. Let's not live a dull life that ends up being useless, unfruitful, and not worthwhile. I'm inviting you on to something more. And at our church, that's how I talk to people, to invite them into a new level 
of disciple making, if you would like to use that term. So, okay. The end. When the pug says it's done, it's done. There's the pug. I don't have a pug. Okay. We have questions for about eight minutes. Do we, you're not doing cards, are you? Just. Okay. Go ahead. Dennis? Is it Dennis? Yeah. Okay. You kind of implied there was a concern about the, the youth program. Yeah. Yeah, I like it. I just edit some of the stuff because it's like, I, I don't, I don't, they, they build a whole lot on an individual understanding of Ephesians 2.10. And I don't think they have that right. I switch it. I say we have to understand our divine design. It isn't so much that God has prepared individual specific works for me to do. He has designed me to serve him and do a number of things for him. And I want to understand my divine design. And it's a process well, the, the six-month one, you go through and you figure out your personal values, you figure out your, your purpose, and, you fi and then you go on to say, here's my vision for the next three years and 90 days and so forth. It's really quite a process. Uh, but I, but, and they give you lots of flexibility, so I just edit it to fit my theology. And it's not a problem, but I like it. I, I do. I've gone to their training to do that stuff. All right, this is a tough question. It says, we emphasize being a disciple as well as being a believer. But why is the Greek word for disciple not found in the epistles? And secondarily, is this a kingdom concept? Is this a kingdom word? Um, I did a workshop on that last year. <clears throat> Are you aware of the first part of that statement? The word disciple shows up in the Gospels and Acts and you know how many times it shows up in the epistles. Now, the letters are written to us in this, in this administration or dispensation. I think that we, it is easy to rightfully emphasize the letters because they're written to us for this present dispensation that we live in. Do you know how many times the word make disciples or disciple show up? He commands them to make disciples and you get to the letters and they never talk about it. They never talk. And you, you go to churches nowadays and what are churches supposed to be doing? It's always about make disciples. Make disciples. And I, I'm fascinated. I'm like, like, which letter of the New Testament did you get that from? Paul didn't say that to Corinth, Ephesus, or any of the other churches he talked to. A little odd. A little strange. Let me give you my opinionated opinion and conclusion. Okay. Disciple is a word that I think was very much tied and connected to Jewish culture and to Jesus being present. It's used a little bit in Acts after he's gone. But I think what happens is there's a shift because with the church, we're both Gentile and uh, Jewish. And I think what happens is it shifts to an emphasis of uh, teaching and not so much Jewish discipleship, disciple making. The word disciple-making only shows up four times in Matthew, and the last one is Matthew 28 when he gives that command. But yet, men that were standing there, when they wrote letters, they didn't say Paul wasn't standing there, John was, uh, Peter was. They didn't say Peter, a disciple of Jesus. Do you know what they switched the word to? Bond servant, bond servant, bond servant. I think our task isn't making disciples. I think our task is making bond servants. Bond servants. And that changes it. A disciple is, as a learner. That's the, name of the, that's the use of the word, a learner. And we tend to emphasize knowledge. But actually, the New Testament letters emphasize serving. Now, this measuring stick looks different. Am I a good servant of Jesus Christ? Well, how is that measured? faithfulness, doing what the master asks, having a good attitude. Do you see how the measuring stick looks different? But yet, over and over and over, Paul did it as well, the writers of the New Testament letters said bondservant. When we get to Revelation, I'm sorry, I'm not remembering the, letter, the uh, verse right offhand, it does not talk about disciples in, in eternity. It talks about those who serve 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 
servants. That's, so I don't think it's a kingdom concept. I think it was a earthly ministry Jesus concept, and it switched and broadened. So now we have a great deal more flexibility on what that looks like. It doesn't have to be one-on-one Jesus individual things. Yeah, go. I don't think so. Um, I, yeah, yeah, thank you. Uh, is sanctification primarily about self-interest? Motivated, Motivated by self-interest. Okay, uh, I, I don't have verses for this, so let me give you my opinionated opinion. Okay, my opinionated opinion is that over the life of a believer, it changes. At the front end, I think it is. And that's why they'll look at return on investment, so forth. Uh, and I can talk those languages. I think what happens is it translates more into love for Jesus and, and doing things. And I think it parallels a marriage. When I first get married, when I first got married, uh, I, I look back at, uh, you know, what I was like when I got married. And I was like, how did that even survive? Uh, we're selfish. And we tend to think it's the other person's fault. Okay? But as life goes on, you shift and you become other focused. So later, now, I'm much more willing to say, to say, no, my dear, it wasn't your fault. It was my fault. It was my fault. And I'm concerned about loving and serving her. Okay? So I think there's a transition that takes place in the maturing process. And I think you end up with multiple things. My opinionated opinion is, I think it starts out selfish. But it, I don't think, if, it, if we grow, I don't think it stays there. Does that make sense? Sorry, I don't have a verse. Just an opinion. Okay. Any other questions? Yes. That's good. That's a better answer than mine. That's fantastic. Yeah, do you see what he, what he said? Let me, I'll do it for the recording. It's the same process we see as our children grow. They start out immensely selfish, and they scream because the entire world is supposed to serve them. And as they make progress, we see indications of progress when they focus on other people and start caring about somebody besides themselves. It indicates growth and maturity in the process. Excellent example. Excellent. Let me pray. We're done. Lord, help us to engage, to live a life that not only pleases you, but one that has eternal value. And you have provided us with many different motivations for doing that. Lord, help us not to waste our lives. Help us to encourage others. Help us to invite others into an elevated life that has eternal significance. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, thanks.